This is my co-host for the evening, Veronica Gonzalez. Um, and welcome on behalf of University Housing and the conversation series um, to Community Conversations, Dia de los Muertos. Um, let's see. Uh, so just a little background information on the Community Conversations. Um, it's a uh, initiative by the University of Oregon um, called Brain, Oregon Brain Tank. It's changed over a few couple years. It's been morphed into something wonderful. Um, and we meet Tuesdays at 5.30 um, to 6.30 right across the walkway or the lawn in the um, uh, conference room. Um, so feel free to, if you have any ideas for different panels, we hold panels in these conversations every um, winter and spring term. So feel free to join us. So I'd like to acknowledge um, our co-sponsors for this event, which are the um, Clark Honors College, the Oregon Humanities Center, Undergraduate Studies, and the UO Libraries who have <coughs> collaborated with University Housing for the past nine years to make this series possible. Um, our event is scheduled to conclude at 8.30 and there will be time for questions and discussions from our panelists after the presentations. So um, at this time I'd like to honor and introduce um, our guest speakers for this evening. Um, Amy Costales received her MA in Spanish and li Spanish <coughs> literature from the University of Oregon and has taught elementary, middle, and high school in the California public school system, as well as in international schools such as India and Thailand. She is an award-winning bilingual children's author and an advocate for multicultural education. And our second panelist for tonight is Pedro Caro. Um, he's an assistant professor of Spanish in the Department of Romance Languages. Uh, he received his PhD from King's College London, and his research focuses on the relationship between nationalist narratives and the discourse of progress and moder modernity, as, um, as seen by intellects and the writers in Latin America, the US, <coughs> and Spain. He is currently working on a manuscript um, on literature and mining in the Americas, and has recently published several articles in the way in which Spanish writers portray Latin America and Latin American nationalism. So could you please give, each give them a warm welcome? The, the way we uh, we actually conspired to talk about what we would do tonight briefly or coffee today, uh, so that we wouldn't just organize it now. Uh, and, and so we, we like the model of the conversation. I think it's there, but <coughs> the community conversation. Uh, and that's what we used also as a protector to the PowerPoint. And we did a division of labor in a way. <coughs> so um, Amy will explain what she plans to do. And I'll, I'm going to just give some basic, very, very basic, broad information about the background, the historical and ethnographic background of Dia de Muertos. Um, and also partly my, my lived experience. But, but Amy has lots of other very hands-on pieces that she's going to share with us. So as I got ready to, uh, as I started thinking about what I was going to talk about, I started wondering why I was here, actually. And I think I'm here because I'm a Spanish instructor at the University of Oregon, and in my Spanish classes, we always build an altar. And I think somebody remembered that, and, and thus here I am. And um, I don't think I consider myself in any way an expert on Dia de los Muertos. And also, although I'm part Latina, it wasn't part of my growing up, because my family is Cuban. And I, I mentioned these things for, for three reasons. One, that I'm going to tell you a personal story of basically falling in love with Dia de los Muertos. So it's going to combine a my, my own story with Dia de los Muertos as well as cultural information. Also, to remind you that it's not something celebrated by all Latinos. And lastly, that my story about Dia de los Muertos is placed in the United States. And I opened up my internet yesterday and saw that uh, the first thing I saw was uh, an article about Dia de los Muertos becoming more important in the United States as uh, Latino communities grow and do more community organizing. So I think I'm going to give you a personal approach to uh, Dia de los Muertos. Mm -hmm. yeah, no also, Pedro was once my advisor, so I don't want to get really deeply intellectual in front of him. Once Why? upon a time, he was my advisor because it brings well, back those anxious feelings. That's the best reason to be the intellectual. <laughs> I only found out today we were speaking together. There was some form of training there, so you should become deeply involved. Now, I mean, we we wanted to um, okay to pose several questions about this. First, um, what do we understand by Dia de los Muertos? It's a very Mexican festival. It's 
So it's it's uh, even in Mexico, um, it's not called Dia de los Muertos everywhere. Uh, Dia de los Muertos is a very, um, in a way, very radical and, and very um, politically charged naming, because the Catholic Church won't have anything to do with that naming, for instance. Um, if it was for the Catholic Church, it would be called Dia de Difuntos, which is much more formal, Day of the Defunct, or, uh, or those who have passed away, or it would be called Day of All Saints, uh, that's tomorrow, the second, okay? So, and that's why there are two days of celebration, because right? there are two days in which the Catholic Church sins well in, you know, the, the um, institutionalized Catholic Church in, the, in about the seventh century, so to celebrate all the martyrs and all saints that have died for the Christian faith. So, <clears throat> why do I say that it's a radical uh, naming or a political naming? And that's because, as you well know, we live in the Americas, and this is a land that's been settled and colonized. If you walk around the campus, you'll see several statues. And most of the statues here have to do with colonizers, who, with the people who kicked out the previous settlers here. Uh, we don't have um, any of the cultures um, around this campus of, of the people who lived here before. But if you're you going to say that, I've noticed the same thing. Except the, the, long the house. park or the long house. But I went to the park recently with my son to play, and I don't know if you've ever been to the River Park. Many of you are probably beyond the point of spending a lot of time on playgrounds. But it is a uh, tribute to the uh, colonists, the U.S. colonists of Oregon, <coughs> and it made me very sad when I looked at it. I mean, it's part of our history to celebrate, but um, there's another side of the story, too, and if you look, there's, there's language, like um, the only woman in the area was, you can see this around town in various places, the only woman in the area was uh, Eugene Skinner's wife, and then I think, really, there were no other women in the area, and there is uh, a tribute to Native cult, cult Native uh, culture, but it's across the river, along the bike trail, there's rocks. Um, and then it's an important addition, but it's, it's funny, that segregation in our history that you see right, right in Eugene. So something that, 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 that we always work with when teaching Latin American studies, and, and certainly Spanish in Latin America, and the Latin American context is, of course, that we're teaching the language of the colonizers to begin with, uh, as much as English is also the language of the colonizing. Uh, tradition, but also that there are lots of connections, that, that you can really look at American history as uh, this, the history of the Americas, and that you can then all of a sudden start to think, okay, Dia de los Muertos, Dia de los Muertos, from either, either way works, um, is, you know, th this, this kind of very Mexican celebration about death uh, that becomes really <coughs> radical. But hang on a second, in the, in the States, actually only in the States, and emerging only out of the very kind of puritanical region of the, of the New Englanders, you also have Halloween emerging. And actually Halloween deals with a very local staple food that Native Americans used, which is pumpkins, uh, right? I mean, so what, what is that connection? Some people have talked about those connections and why do we celebrate uh, with food the dead, <coughs> and, and this goes very deeply to the fact that, uh, that there is a, a kind of marginal remnant of a suppressed culture that we have, in a way, cannibalized, that we have incorporated into our culture. We have translated it, we can say, if you will. So now we can, probably, when we look at some of the um, at the artwork of, of pumpkins, for instance, or at the sugar skulls, we are actually looking at pre-European art and our, at pre-European history. And we live it. We, we are, in a way, Indianized, if you, if you can use that expression, if you will. Or, or, or in a way, we are practicing cultures that are non-European <coughs> without even acknowledging I just read an article yesterday talking about the same thing, and it's uh, how can we talk about Italian tomatoes and we talk about Swiss chocolate? And there was a long example, and what's wrong with calling them Swiss chocolate and Italian tomatoes? Does anybody know? There was a list of like 10 foods that are considered uh, just delicious foods, and they were all placed in Europe. What's wrong with that picture? 
Where are chocolate and tomatoes from? Uh, the Irish potato, tied to the Irish potato famine. Where are all these foods from? No. The Americas. So they're all foods developed by Native Americans. And this article was about this cannibal, <coughs> this taking of, of Native culture and placing it in Europe. Every time you say chocolate, you're actually speaking Aztec. It means now bitter water. Uh, and tomato as well. Actually, avocado, and, and now it is aguacato, and, and it means testicle uh, because of its shape, of course. I didn't know that. Yeah. So you, you, you speak native languages <laughs> without knowing. Uh, we make constant references to cultures that we don't know anymore, that we incorporated. And, and, and Westerners very proudly think, you know, I, I remember having a, a Greek friend, and, and, and we'll move on from the anecdotal to, to talk a bit more about the background, and we'll do some of the hands so, up. But, but going back to the tomatoes, I had a Greek friend who um, was doing um, architecture, uh, a PhD actually at MIT, you know, huge brain, you know, talk about brain tanks. Uh, and uh, he would not believe that tomatoes were not from the old world. Uh, even though he, he was doing his PhD, and he was not convinced that Socrates had never had Greek salad. Um, you know, the food is very nationalistic, and so he had to look it up in the middle of a dinner. You know, we would have this conversation. So, you know, that's the framework, more or less, in which we wanted to understand what Dia de Muertos is about. Because it's not only, or we don't want to just present it only as this exotic carnival with death that some people practice out there. Okay. You also just practice something that wasn't really supposed to be that funny uh, when the Puritans were around. So wh why is that uh, mocking of death relationship that the Native Americans in, in the Mesoamerican area <coughs> developed? And, 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 and we need to talk a bit um, about that. So I wanted to show you just a few slides. First, we begin with... <coughs> Uh, I'm going to try and do um, a, a kind of pendular argument in a way. So to begin with, we could talk about the fact that playing with death or, or talking about death is not a Mexican thing, uh, that Mexicans are not more obsessed with death than I'm from Spain, you know, and, uh, than, than Spaniards <laughs> might be, or than um, Brits or, or Swedes or... So, you know, death is a human experience. That, that's the kind of first thesis, right? So, you know, we all have to deal with death. Different cultures are dealt with death in different <coughs> ways. Um, most cultures um, have a religion um, that tries, in a way, to explain, account for, deal with death, narrate it. So, the, the first the slide shows, you know, the, the, the kind of dog headed god. Um, Anubis in Egypt trying to um, take the soul of a deceased person over to the other side, and, and what the Egyptians understood as a trip. And that's not unlike the traditions in Mesoamerica and in, in most of Western culture about what death is. It's a, it's a form of traveling, it's a form of uh, transmigration of souls. Most people, even though they might be Christians, believe in reincarnation even. Um, you know, the fact that you may um, purify your soul over time, that, you, that you're not quite dead when you're dead. Somehow, you, some part of you survives. And that's the idea of the soul. Um, different cultures have different numbers of souls even. Uh, and, and so, why Dia de Muertos is so exciting to us? Why, why do we need to understand Mexicans around the idea of death? Uh, what do you think? <laughs> I mean, is, is, is there a particular reason why we portray and then Mexicans also portray themselves uh, and, and foster this idea that uh, it's what anthropologists, you know, someone like Lomnitz and others call um, the Mexican intimacy <coughs> of death. The fact that Mexicans are somehow more comfortable talking about death, making jokes about death. Uh, linguists have collected uh, hundreds of names to refer to la muerte, to death. Uh, la pelada, uh, 
you know, they're, they're, they're helpless at this point in, in Mexico, and it depends also regionally. Um, La Verdad being a, a very popular one, meaning the, the boldy one, uh, right? So how many names for death are there in, in English? Or is it puritanically just reduced to this very intellectualized concept? And that's probably one major cultural cultural difference. And that's where the intimacy <coughs> with death that we all perceive and that is highly uh, represented in culture uh, probably kicks in, where, where you see that Mexicans do deal with death in a nationally different way. Uh, and so it is the antithesis, okay? I presented the thesis. It's a human uh, commonality. And yet, Mexican culture has elaborated has developed a different code, a different narrative about it. And we can look at some of the um, origins of the, of the contemporary uh, uses and, and, and depictions of death. Of course, there's nothing Mexican about a skull. We're all supposed to know the skulls, right? <laughs> so again, it's the same thing. It's a very human thing. And yet, why? Does Mexican iconography from even pre Hispanic times have this obsessive, um, you know, overpowering presence of, of bones and, and skulls? And, and of course, it has to do with historical reasons, you know, that the way in which um, the religion of the Mesoamerican people developed its codes about death. Instead of using a dog on the top of the skull, they used the naked skull. Uh, why did Egyptians decide to use a dog to represent that nevis? Why don't we uh, ridicule that or think about that frowning? Or, or, you know, this, is, this is a slightly less um, disguised or, or less hidden. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a skull that is not quite dead. It's a skull that is actually alive. It's a skull that is smiling at us. And therefore, it represents not a dead person, but the non-dead. The not quite dead, the undead, okay? So the idea of the soul, in a way, the idea that you're dead, and yet there is something that survives. There's something that can move on to another stage. And this is what religion everywhere is supposed to be about. <clears throat> so, Mirteka Siwatl. Siwatl means lady. Uh, and Mixteca is the, is the land of the in-between, the land of the beyond. Um, so this is the lady of death, the, 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 not, not unlike La Santa Muerte, uh, of which I, I didn't bring a picture, I didn't want to spook you too much, but, I, but that's going to be your homework. You're going to have to understand what is the cult of La Santa Muerte in Mexico today. So when you go away, you, you, you should Google Saint Death, La Santa Muerte, and think back. Well, this is, you know, very scary. You know, what, what do Mexicans do down there? Okay? Don't do that. Don't, don't look at it that way. You know? Set, set your anthropologist, uh, historian, scholar, <coughs> on, and think back at how, even though it's in Spanish now, La Santa Muerte, you're actually looking at a live Aztec figure. How, you know, despite 500 years of colonization, we still have Native American practices that are very alive and that have a different narrative um, about the beyond. One of the um, important gods in the Aztec pantheon could also be related to death and is very easily translatable. Um, you know, if you mix and match as the um, anthropologist monks who invaded Mexico in the 16th century did, you could very much think about someone like um, Vitzilo Pochni. You can see the, the Spanish handwriting from the 16th century in this codex. The, 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 Spaniards, when they conquered uh, Mexico, 
were completely obsessed about the local languages. You probably will know that there is a grammar of Nahuatl uh, that was <coughs> published before there was a grammar of English. Right? So, because they wanted to learn uh, the local languages to, of course, um, convert into Christianity, the, the Native Americans, the, the Aztecs. And so a, a, a good way of knowing about it um, was, of course, getting to know their pantheon, their gods, and seeing how you could translate these <coughs> into the Christian gods, that is to say the saints, uh, or the, you know, Our Lady, and the many apparitions or avatars of uh, the Virgin Mary, and so on. And so Huitzilopochtli, who's close to Mars in the in the Latin pantheon, is the is the god of death as well, because he's the god of the war, the god of ritual wars, as well as as the god of of, uh, of conquest for the Aztecs, who were a very uh, um, warring nation. And here you see a depiction of the temple of the eagles and the eagle warriors of Huitzilopochtli. And next to it is a Tzompantli, which is a collection of skulls from uh, the conquered people that the Aztec did, had defeated and had killed um, and had amassed as their relics. So immediately, uh, you know, for Christian uh, conquerors to see relics, temples, uh, warriors, conquerors, you know, the, the, the similarities, the parallelisms between cultures was pretty much immediate. These, these were uh, Christians from the 16th century who had just started to fight the Protestant aberration in the north as well in, in Europe and who had all the medieval traditions about death and about uh, saints, bones being sacred and all of these things. So, you know, this afternoon we were talking about how you know, we could present Dia de Muertos as the example of mestizaje. You have, have you heard this word before, mestizaje? Mestizaje means the um, syncretism, the mixture of culture <coughs> that is Mexico, right? Or, or the States, if you want it to be, the melting pot, right? Uh, so that we could narrate Mexican history as the triumph of the encounter of different cultures. That's the kind of public official narrative of the Mexican state. Uh, you know, th there is this marriage of the Spanish and Native American cultures that has become Mexico. But, but you could also narrate it problematically, or, or, or uh, you know, we, were, we were saying, um, in, in a very um, conflicting way as the survival of the colonized, and not their mixing, the, the, the remnant of their ways of praying, of their ways of believing, and, and not the giving up or giving in. So one of the gods that you have there hasn't survived, even though there are many idols, many um, gods and statues. Huitzilopochtli looked a lot like the Christ, because he was made of corn. He was edible, like Christ. Uh, and so you have all of these incredible cultural parallelisms that are easily translatable. I'll, go, I'll show you towards the end, you know, in, in two slides, uh, what we used to eat when I was a kid in Spain on El Dia de Difuntos, today. Uh, and, and you'll see the parallelisms again that, you know, both confirm the hypothesis of syncretism and mixture and also show you the difference. This would have been what might have come in the boats with the Spaniards, heretical cards to play. You know, the sailors love to play cards everywhere you went around the Mediterranean. And this is a tarot card that was very popular from the 13th century onwards in, in the southern port of France in Marseille, uh, where death, you know, a very human uh, fact, is represented as this changing of, um, you know, this life-changing, of course, experience. You know, this moment where everything is, is turned upside down. If you get 
the tarot card, uh, has anyone had it read? The, the tarot, ever? Well, but you know that there is this card, right? I'm sure you all know there is this card, and if, and if you are going to be uh, read the tarot cards at some point in your life, you'll be dreading that this card might appear, because we all are scared of death. And yet tarot readers interpret this in different ways depending on where it falls. And they might interpret it as just a life-changing experience, or as a turn of, uh, you know, in your life, as a new period in your life, because tarot readers believe in reincarnation and change. But so this, this iconography is pre-conquest, and it ties in very well with the some pantry, right? It ties very well with the um, iconographic representation of the skulls and bones uh, that pirates used, that Aztecs used, that sailors used in their cards. The third, um, and, and our final, um, this is the slide I was referring to earlier, um, image wants to kind of juxtapose these two. So you have the edible skulls, you have the edible gods, the, the wheat god of Christ that is somehow buried and then all of a sudden as a plant he resurrects and comes up again. And you can eat it uh, every Sunday if you want. And you have the, the sort of corn god that is also the war god because we fight over our corn in Mesoamerica that you can also somehow plant and eat. Uh, and, and, and all of a sudden you have this new product imported into the Americas <coughs> that enslaves everyone into the plantation, which is sugar, and also becomes this kind of very problematic product. It's, uh, it depletes your teeth in ways that nothing had done before the conquest. It destroys your health, and yet it, it, it's, it, it, you get too attached to it, right? You're all hooked on the sugar, I'm sure. Like all of us. Right? So it's it's the it's it's the new thing of the 16th and, and 17th century, and all of a sudden you get sugar skulls everywhere in Mexico, and so there's this transformation of previous rituals, the the rituals of mitzka uh, tziwatl that used to be at the beginning of August, that the monks move over to the European feast of the defunct the 1st of November, the Day of All Saints, so that it's no longer the adoration of this goddess, but now it's Catholic. And so it is part of the cultural conquest. It's part of that spiritual conquest that we've been talking about. But it is still surviving in the form of feeding your <coughs> dead people uh, with food, believing that they are only traveling, believing that they're somewhere <coughs> there being taken care of spiritually by God or by this goddess. And you also eat them. You also eat them like you would eat Christ or like you eat other dead people because that's part of the, the ritual of thinking that we're not gone, that we are being renewed, that we're resuscitating somehow, that we are recycled. Yes, recycled back into nature. That's why you put people into the ground so that they are planted and sometime in the future they will uh, grow back. Uh, and next to it is a picture of what, as I was saying, as a small child growing up in Cartagena in southeastern Spain, we used to eat. These are called saint's bones. And they, they're just made of sugar and actually pumpkin inside. So they probably pose conquest as well, in a way, though they must have a base in the, in the Middle Ages, I'm sure. And they are like eating the relics. You know, these are supposed to be eaten on the Day of All Saints. You know, French also celebrate the Day of All Saints. It's called that Toussaint, uh, All Saints Day <coughs> in England and so on. So, I mean, it's a very Christian celebration, but it's a celebration that is accompanied by pagan rites. Not unlike Christmas. Have you ever thought where the Christmas tree comes from? Okay, so it's, it's a practice, constant practice in European conquest, adapting, converting, and exchanging. So the Christmas tree, of course, is a German god that people used to adorn uh, in the hope, again, that it would resurrect, that the trees would come back in the spring after the winter. And so let's, you know, 
put it into perspective in a way, think about the fact that this is uh, a pre-European <coughs> festivity that we're looking at, that's been somehow recycled, cannibalized by European thought, by European traditions, and yet it's really alive. If you go to cemeteries today in Mexico, you see altars everywhere, you'll see altars here in schools in Eugene, where people bring food to the altar, like they would have done in pre-Hispanic times. Uh, the church wouldn't allow food into the churches. So this is really a pre-Hispanic tradition. And um, Amy is going to demonstrate for us how to build an altar today. So I think it's going to be very exciting. And if you go to cemeteries, as I was saying, you'll also see people bringing actual food to their dead, like Egyptians would do. So this is not, again, an oddity, Mexican practice. This is a very human and a very Mexican tradition. So the first time I saw an altar be built, I was in Napa, California, and there was a Mexican-American woman in the community. And uh, she's in a, in a community, in an elementary school, she would build an altar. And people would come and make calaveras. Uh, she would talk about the altar, all the elements of the altar. Uh, traditions around Day of the Dead, and I went and was very found it very intriguing. And a friend of mine had just committed suicide, and suddenly here was a man making calaveras, and he was writing the names of people that were important to you on the sugar skulls. So I, I hadn't really thought about it till I got up there, and suddenly his name popped into my head, and and she wrote it, and then I held it in my hands, and it was a, a very interesting experience for me. And I think from that day on. I found it intriguing. But she was interesting to me, to me for other reasons, too, because she taught uh, English to people in the community who were migrant farm workers. And there were teachers in the community who needed to change their uh, credentials to be teachers. They needed to add Spanish. So she taught Spanish to them. And why, why this is interesting to me is a lot of times when I've encountered Day of the Dead celebrations in the United States, it's about celebrating Day of the Dead. But it's also about building a community in, in a sort of grassroots way. And that was my first encounter with, with that. Um, I was a Spanish teacher at the time, so I decided to celebrate Day of the Dead in my classroom. And I taught 200 students every day. And how does every student bring in an altar? Well, I've read that altars often, particularly amongst more uh, indigenous populations in Mexico, is about building height. So we stacked tables up in our classroom and covered them with cloth like this. In the beginning of the day, there was my altar. And at the end of the day, there were 200 altars. And it's, there's something very beautiful when you see all this work that students have put together about a friend, a cousin, a grandmother, a dog, with the flowers and the candles. And it was beautiful. But it was also interesting to me because about half of my students were Latino. And that year, said <coughs> who's a Mexican-American musician, one of the first crossover musicians singing the English and Spanish, it had just been shot. And so I had about 30 altars or pieces for Selena in there. And again, I thought it was um, an interesting way for people to be able to celebrate and commemorate something that was very important to them and something that wasn't necessarily going to be discussed amongst the rest of the school because often things that are important to Latino students, I noticed, aren't addressed. Uh, nationwide, so I, I found that intriguing. So I started celebrating Day of the Dead in my classroom, and slowly as I started doing this, it became something uh, in my house as well. But I have a funny story about it as well. I write children's books, and um, one year I wrote a story about immigration, something that I do know a lot about, and I got a letter back saying, you know, this is a very political story, and you can't write this story, but could you write a story about Day of the Dead? So I went back and I decided I was going to write a story about Day of the Dead, and I started thinking about my grandmother, and I had this whole story planned out where when my grandmother died and what that meant to us and how we could think about her with Day of the Dead, and it's, 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 it can even be soothing. It's a way of celebrating the, uh, somebody who's, who's important to you and is dead. And I, start, I had the whole story written out, and then I started thinking about that grandmother, and then I started thinking about my mother, and I started thinking about my husband's mother, who are very live grandmothers. And I think it's kind of ironic that instead I ended up with a book called uh, Abuelita Full of Life, and although there's an altar in here, it's not about Day of the Dead. Uh, I should have written that Day of the Dead book because the book was uh, nominated for a very important award, and the book that won 
was about Day of the Dead. But um, <laughs> anyway, funny enough, as I wrote this story, I started thinking it was interesting that I talk about Day of the Dead in my classroom, and here I was raising a Mexican child, and I wasn't uh, doing much at home. And this writing this book made me start building altars in my own house. And we started with uh, pictures. And when we do it at our house, it's much bigger, but I'm not that strong, and I didn't feel like pulling my son's wagon. But we started with something that was very much part of my Catholic upbringing, uh, Italian, Cuban, which is putting out a pitcher and putting a candle. So we started simple with uh, pictures of people in the morning <coughs> and lighting a candle. And here is uh, La Virgen de Guadalupe, which is the Mexican representation of, of Mary, uh, also uh, a woman that carries both uh, indi an indigenous past as well as uh, the Catholicism of colonizers. So she's my favorite, uh, my favorite. And we like that. And then I started adding fruit. And in a sort of playful way, I add my uh, relative's worst addiction. Some of them I'm not allowed to bring here, but I will put out alcohol for my grandmother, who in her 90s was known to drink to the point of falling over if we were dancing. <laughs> Chocolate for my grandfather who died of diabetes. Fruit, because an altar traditionally has fruit because the dead may be hungry. I lived in India when I started doing this, so I looked up a recipe for pan de muerto, and I started making pan de muerto with my daughter. Um, now I can go to local Plaza Latina and buy my pan de muerto, but every once in a while we make it too. So again, the bread is there because <coughs> the muertos are going to be hungry. And I've seen tequila, but I also know they need water. And when my son was little, we started making calaveras because I can't find them in Eugene. And we're not so artistic, so you can buy these online because many Latinos, <coughs> I don't know, think it's a way of expressing culture today. So we bought this and we make our sugar skulls every year. And I find the images intriguing. So this is an artwork in my house. We have many figures. Do you recognize who that is? Frida Kahlo. Hmm. We have here La Catrina, very famous figure. And the flowers. They're supposed to be marigolds. I have mumps. Simpasochil, again, uh, indigenous words that have slipped into Spanish as well as into English. These flowers have a strong smell and supposed to keep evil spirits away and draw the souls of the dead. And I believe I lost somewhere my incense. So, these are the traditional elements to put on an altar. Papel picado. This is plastic. We live in Eugene. And it's not necessarily the images I would have liked, but um, Armando Morales, who also puts on the uh, events in the community, told me that uh, the sound of it recreates the concept of wind. So those are traditional elements in a Day of the Dead culture. And um, I also wanted to say that there's quite a few things going on in town this week. You can go up walk up 15th, just a little bit east of campus, and go to the Maude Kern Center, and you'll see an art exhibit. Tomorrow you can go to the Long House on the U of O campus and see a very traditional uh, <coughs> celebration of Day of the Dead. You can also go on Friday night downtown at 5 o'clock in the Peace School. There is a community event as well where many local artists are uh, have made altars, have done other uh, works of art. And I find it interesting, again, because to me that's about uh, efforts of people in our community to uh, celebrate, celebrate Day of the Dead. And it says a lot about just grassroots uh, efforts in this town. So if you're interested enough to come here, I uh, would encourage
encourage you to also go out into your community, into your Latino community, and see what's going on. And um, in the end, my family has somehow managed to become very involved in this. I have a son who dances in Ballet Folklorico. When Maude Kurtz opens the Day of the Dead celebration, my uh, family and I always build an altar that we take to Eugene Arte Latino's uh, event. And my husband, who's studying art at LCC, has been working on uh, paintings for the last couple of weeks that he's going through them here. <coughs> You had a question or a comment a while ago. Did you forget? Yeah, um, well, <clears throat> he was saying or asking why we thought that um, Mexicans had developed this different attitude toward death. And I was thinking maybe it's because when you become more familiar with something, it's less scary. So, because they have this intimate relationship with death, it's less of something to be afraid of and you can embrace it. And, and why do you think, and so my question back would be, why do you think <coughs> Mexicans are more used to death than other societies? <coughs> why, I don't, is it a more violent society, is that what it is? Um, I really don't know anything about mortality rates or what they used to be because obviously this is a, like you said, it's a pre-colonization, it's a mix between uh, pre-colonization and colonized celebration. So, I mean, I could imagine that if there were higher mortality rates that it would be something, some part of normal life that would have to be integrated to become more familiar. <coughs> I don't know any statistics about it. Well, that's, uh, you know, we were talking about, uh, about this today too. The, the mortality rates, of course, spiraled with the conquest to begin with. So, any rituals that might have been <coughs> active before the conquest, of which we don't have any native text to account for, um, would have been modified already just by, for instance, smallpox. As you know, everyone is now scared that the terrorists might bring smallpox. Well, you know, Europeans brought the smallpox to the new world uh, and brought alcohol uh, and brought other things that Native Americans did not have. Uh, and so those were uh, <coughs> decimating factors, uh, let alone the, the enslavement, of course, and the, and the right, um, you know, the, just straightforward genocide that, that happened. And so um, all of a sudden, death becomes just very, very quotidian, very every day. Uh, and, and so whatever forms you may have had to deal with death before, when your community was more or less stable and you had your harvest and you had your, your you know, you, you knew who your chieftain was and you know who the enemy people might be or not, etc. <coughs> began completely, not erased, but became really shaken by this process of acculturation into Christianity and moving around of people. <coughs> we, we forget, but, but People uh, who lived in southern Mexico were pushed to fall forward north or to the coast to work <coughs> in the ports. You know, they were they were in in, in slave trains basically everywhere in, in the in the colony in New Spain, as it was called, uh, and, and they were whipped to, to be carried everywhere. Um, monks and, a, and other commentators talk in their chronicles about how uh, meek and subservient these people are, and yet how in their meekness, uh, when they come to church, they also manage to put in some food under the, under the, la the, 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 the tombstones. How they keep their habits uh, intact, even though they are now adoring our Christ and our cross and our lady. Cody, Cody do you remember, Cody went to, and I went to Querétaro all this summer to study Spanish. Do you remember looking at uh, churches in, uh, w do you remember ways, I'm putting you on the spot now, do you remember ways in which on the artwork uh, they managed to keep, uh, have their own say? Do you remember anything in the artwork? I don't remember like the specific ways. I remember, I definitely remember all the churches and um, even that, I can't remember the name of the market now, but 
they even had uh, altars and stuff set up like that just at that market. Um, they, were more, they were not day to the dead, they went to the dead ones, but still. Okay. Um, Which is something we didn't mention that people have altars up all year long. Yeah. Um, we went on a tour to look at churches and to look at missions, and she was asked the woman that took us, who's an anthropology professor, asked us to take a look at the grapes. If you looked at the grapes, you suddenly noticed the grapes being uh, uh, something that came from Europe, uh, showing abundance and life. And this was the imagery they wanted on the, the churches. And if you looked carefully, you could notice that the grapes looked an awful lot like corn. So it's interesting that having your own say. <coughs> So this is, you know, it's a question with an answer, I guess, you know, the kinds of questions that we're trying to pose. So, yes, altars are now visible every day. Uh, now Mexicans in L.A. tattoo their skins with the skulls that look a lot like the representations of Day of the Dead. So it's fast becoming, uh, and this is something that, you, that I've seen in my lifetime, and you're going to see more of it in yours, it's fast becoming uh, like the ragtag flag of the pirates, in a way, okay? To make a sort of crass <laughs> comparison, right? So it is becoming a, a, an image of resistance, an image of, okay, yes, I, I am much more used to death, because yes, I've, I've had to experience much more death in my family. I've had to experience this long period of colonization that is still goes on, because, of course, colonization never stopped in the Americas, as we all know. Uh, and, you know, even today, you know, the, just looking for jobs has become really difficult in Mexico itself, as you know, in the past 15 years, coinciding with the free trade agreement with the U.S., where the U.S. has patented most of the Mexican Native American corn and is selling the, the patented corn back to the villages can't even afford it. So agriculture has completely imploded in Mexico. Mexicans are start, starting to import <coughs> corn for the first time in history. This is a new form of colonialism. This is what we call neo-colonialism. And so, you know, how, how do we get back at that? You know, we get back at that with culture very often and with cultural representations of who we are as a group that is going to make us strong, that is going to make us believe that we're not defeated yet. Uh, and a way of, of showing that we're not defeated is we'll survive beyond that. My skull is mine. Well, uh, thank you. I want to thank um, Dr. Amy and Peter so much for coming to this community conversation. This is not a lo such a lovely presentation. Um, we do have cookies to decorate on um, finding sugar skulls in.